and welcome to the Vonu podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your humble AI robot co-host, Brian Free Robot, coming to you from the Veritas node of the Free Republic of Pasnia. Today, I have two classic articles by Kyle Reardon on the big subject of conversation on today, November 5th. No, unfortunately, this isn't pertaining to the NFL trade deadline, which would be a much more light-hearted and preferred conversation, but rather, the 2024 selection. Please also check the show notes for a classic episode of Lua Radio from 2016 titled, Your Vote for President is Completely Irrelevant, especially if you're a constitutionalist that's never read the Constitution. Clowns? Anyway, let's dive in. Some Thoughts on Political Crusading by Kyle Reardon Political crusading, also known as bullshit libertarianism, is synonymous with reformism, which is any attempt at working inside of the system in order to change it from within, in other words, reformism is applied collectivism. It operates on the presumption that individuals do not matter, and that therefore only what the collective wants is what matters, in the final equation. Ideologues believe in the sanctity of the centrally planned tragedy of the commons, and they falsely justify the precautionary principle to shun market options as any sort of viable response to tyranny, preferring instead the empty moral platitudes of democracy. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Rayo expressed his utter revulsion with political crusading. Pointing out the despicable nature of reformist sophistry Rayo said, Objections of the political crusaders to self-liberation, mostly innuendos, ex-cathedra pronouncements and misrepresentations, have been refuted by me, Spring Innovator, page 7-47, and others. But the crusaders have consistently failed to refute or even acknowledge serious objections to any would-be libertarian political movement. But while I reject political crusading as a strategy this does not mean I shun active resistance as a tactic. The self-liberator has tactical advantages over a would-be insurrectionist of any brand. The political crusader who wants to take over or destroy a state, seriously threatens the rulers and will bring strong countermeasures. But the libertarian who is satisfied to coexist in protracted conflict with the state is merely an annoyance. The more astute ruler is aware, as is the libertarian, that most people are sheep and will remain sheep no matter how the libertarian lives. Of course the statist would still rather squash the libertarian if this were easy. So libertarian tactics must be such as to make counter counter ineffective and prohibitively costly. Unfortunately, reformists are strategically incompetent, but that has never given the partyarchy of the anti-libertarian libertarian party, LP, any hesitation whatsoever. It matters not that the LP's own founder, David Nolan, called the very monster he created as a very timid organization composed of a little class of mini-bureaucrats. Rayo also said, While seizing or destroying a state, even if possible, is usually worse than useless, selective counter-attacks may have value. In many ways a bureaucratic apparatus is like a simple biological organism. Pavlovian psychology is applicable. Cause a certain behavior, such as molesting a libertarian, to be painful and an agency will learn not to do it. Although those who are humping the Trump may imagine themselves as budding pseudo-revolutionaries, the reality is that bullshit libertarianism is thoroughly unconvincing because there is no integrity to it, since it imagines that coercive means can be used to achieve voluntary ends. Rayo continues. Now that a collective movementism, also called bullshit libertarianism and political crusading, has been discredited as a liberation strategy, it is appropriate to re-examine strategies which treat freedom as an individually achievable way of life and marketable commodity. While detractors may say that Rayo's approach here is indicative of lifestyle anarchism, or otherwise a form of defeatism, such couldn't be farther from the truth. Recognizing bad strategy and then attempting to self-correct is indicative of the creative destruction within the free market itself. What is happening here is a natural cleaning out process, very much an evolution if you will, of those who falsely claim to be adherents of liberty from those who actually are, given that the latter exercise their freedom without asking permission, in other words, those freedom outlaws who practice direct action. 
If political crusading is not a path to liberty, then what could be? Rayo observes. Political crusaders try to categorize all non-crusaders as retreatists. The retreat concept, as set forth by Harry Brown and Don and Barbara Stevens, means disaster insurance, preparations to survive an expected future politico-economic disaster without substantially altering one's pre-disaster lifestyle. This is not the same as self-liberation, a change in lifestyle is not predicated on coming catastrophe. While a retreater and self-liberator may use some of the same techniques, their attitudes and general approaches are different. I am here concerned mainly with self-liberation. Obviously, the retreaters are survivalists and the self-liberators are vonuists, although I personally think that it is not necessarily a contradiction to be both if an individual so chooses, since they provide a valuable market selection of libertarian resistance to statism. Bouncing back and forth between disaster preparedness and reducing vulnerability to coercion is an admirable effort at increasing personal liberty, especially considering that I think survival and liberty are strongly correlated, survivability requires greater liberty, which is the polar opposite of how authoritarians view human survival, compromising liberty is necessary so as to increase survivability. So long as disaster preparedness is used to reduce one's vulnerability to coercion, say, from looters, and not as a promotional tool for nascent statism, in other words, the war mentality, then I think survivalism and venuism are compatible libertarian methodologies. Even before I decided to become a vonuist, I inadvertently followed Rayo's piece of advice here regarding both social ostracism and media outreach. A note to fellow self-liberators on this, now that several good sources of educational services exist, I suggest a boycott of organizations which are knee-jerk hostile to self-liberation. This is not to suggest that educators must themselves opt out or endorse any particular approach. But it is in our self-interest to reserve trade and contributions for groups which, 1, avoid categorical condemnation of self-liberation and, 2, are open to advertisements of self-liberational media and ventures. The fact of the matter is the soapbox of the alternative media is more effective if the message of liberty is coherent by obeying Occam's razor. Convoluting such a message, such as through political parties like the LP or presidential campaigns like Donald Trump's Making America Great Again, is a sure way to discredit liberty. Feeling the burn, much. Spreading the message of liberty, as it were, is not supposed to be funneled through so-called political activism, which is all about prostrating yourself before those who falsely imagine themselves to be your rulers by making all sorts of concessions, compromises, and deals with the state for undue favors. Not only that, but just because an individual, or worse, an organization, takes up the label of activism does not therefore mean that such folks are sincere, if perhaps foolishly naive, because they really do want to change the world for the better. Examples of disingenuous activists circulate throughout the activist milieu, sometimes outright expressing demonstrably fake grievances, so it is not entirely unreasonable to remain quite skeptical of wild claims, such as running for the presidency in 2020 in order to provide for an orderly dissolution of the federal government. No wonder political crusaders, much like the oxymoronic sovereign citizens and their fake judges, want to put my head on a pike, I'm calling them out on their utter nonsensical diatribes. Their repetitive violations of argumentation ethics by way of using government elections in the attempt to seize coercive, political, power demonstrates that they are the intellectually dishonest enemies of liberty, at least with the fascist conservatives and socialist progressives, those authoritarians have the integrity to refrain from claiming to be my allies. Regarding the strategic implications of venuism, Rayo comments. Libertarians are devising many clever schemes for following up the state. But rather than applying these erratically and willy-nilly, I suggest they be reserved for well-defined limited objectives beneficial to libertarians. As relative capabilities grow, libertarians may be able to realize the de facto immunity from conscription, social security, travel regulations and other especially onerous violations of liberty. Such is my hope for the future as well, however, it is going to require quite a bit of experimentation and transparency in order to gauge their true value. One place to start is by using any method of strategic withdrawal, 
such as that being promoted vis-a-vis -vis vacate the state, in order to revoke your individual consent to be governed to the extent that Leviathan will allow you to do. Once you've gone on a circuit, or two, of political field trips in order to learn for yourself about the systematic wickedness of local government, then likely you'll be emotionally ready to cancel your voter registration. Control Schizophrenia, Why Celebratarians Are Glorifying Donald Trump Betrayal is all too common within the activist milieu. This is primarily due to the scourge of not only fake grievances but also the very existence of disingenuous activists themselves. Opposing intellectual dishonesty by pointing out sophistry is not just limited to argumentation ethics, for those who publicly claim to value liberty and freedom deserve to be boycotted and ostracized should they ever compromise on their principles solely due to the winds of political expediency. Controlled schizophrenia is the mental state of an opportunistic citizen serf who practices doublethink, yet who still acts in his own best interest. Today, this can be observed in the political crusaders, especially those Donald Trump supporters who voted for Ron Paul back during the 2008 and 2012 election cycles. The question to be answered now is, why are any of the celebratarians glorifying Trump? Throughout the 1960s, Rayo described the phenomenon of controlled schizophrenia. He begins by illustrating how an individual's relative freedom could be conceivably measured. Freedom is not a monolithic entity, there are various degrees. But not all degrees are necessarily viable. For most people, I suspect that choices between predominantly servile, vulnerable, lifestyles and predominantly liberated, invulnerable, lifestyles. Obviously, Rayo saw this in terms of shades of grey, as opposed to an absolutist black and white perspective. He continues. If satisfaction could be plotted with respect to freedom for a large number of people, I think the graph would have a low peak of relative satisfaction around 5% to 10% freedom, a higher peak around 90% to 95% freedom, and wide depression in between. While not a bell curve by any means, this hypothesis of his suggests that the vulnerability of the population to coercion could be gauged proportionally. Clearly, the relative proportions of those in the 5 to 10 percent batch vis-a-vis -vis the 90 to 95 percent crowd is itself a separate educated guess, but for purposes of maintaining realism I will presume that the sheer number of those in the 5 to 10 percent freedom range to be higher than those in the 90 to 95 percent liberty curve. If the freedom outlaws comprise the 90 to 95 percent portion, then who is in the 5 to 10 percent segment? Rayo explicates. The lower maximum is exemplified in contemporary society by many a successful middle American. He lives conventionally but takes advantage of some of the easier, more obvious loopholes. He pays income taxes but hires a tax accountant to maximize deductions. He registers for the draft but goes to college in hope of being made a technician instead of a target. His mental state is one of controlled schizophrenia. He believes most of the status myths in which he was indoctrinated yet maintains a modicum of skepticism. He goes to church, or at least accepts their standard of morality, but is not above having a drink at a nude bar. He is largely rational in his work but keeps his rationality compartmented. He does not, dares not critically examine his life as a whole. Given that the controlled schizophrenics are those who enjoy 5 to 10 percent relative freedom, then what advantages do they enjoy that the wide depression of the typical American does not? Rayo explains. Although self-maintained schizophrenia leads to unhealthy and unhappy complications, on the whole the opportunistic serf may have it better than his more consistent, more gullible, less self-motivated brother who is drafted and becomes a target, in a paraplegic rotting in a VA hospital, struggling along in a low-paying, high-tax job with a load of installment debts. In other words, inconsistency, hypocrisy is rewarded by the establishment in the same sense that George Orwell's Julia character expressed the notion that you can disobey the big rules just so long as you kept the small ones. Rayo further extrapolates. But the opportunistic serf is probably also more contented than the nonconformist who tried to be free in some things while remains servile in overall living pattern. 
one who is half free and half surf dwells in a psychological no man's land. He knows too much and thinks too independently to play servile status games with conviction and success, yet remains too immersed in, and influenced by, that culture to achieve success satisfaction on his own terms. This includes many, not all, bohemians, adventurers, black market entrepreneurs, religious-slash-cultural minorities and radicals of all sorts. A half-and-half -half lifestyle tends to be unstable, some go on to more complete liberation, some drift back into, at first, outward conformity, then, acceptance of servile norms, some end in psychosis or early death. Put simply, there are no half-measures when it comes to becoming vonua, that is, comparatively more invulnerable to coercion, in this sense, the struggle to maintain and increase one's independence must continue progressively, or else honest failure ought to be openly embraced, but not a sophist ex post facto rationalization that seeks to avoid judging success or failure on its own merits. Too many individuals begin their path towards liberty with a starry-eyed naivete that, although understandable, is rather quite deadly, I think that the solution to this all too common problem is to inculcate a hard-nosed realism about Leviathan's intrinsic nature, particularly with regard to the reality of democide itself. In order to do this, however, would first involve a stubborn resolve to totally reject political crusading and reformist sophistry alike, so until the oxymoronic anarchist politicians are routinely ostracized as a matter of course, then the controlled schizophrenics who now support the Donald will remain with us for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. What of the freedom outlaws comprising that proportion who are 90 to 95 percent free? Rayo said. The higher maximum of satisfaction is attained by someone with a liberated home based plus some import export with the servile society. For him, contact with the state is an occasional annoyance and danger, not a big part of his life thus he can avoid the psychological paralysis that afflicts so many nonconformists. Compared to the opportunistic serf he may enjoy somewhat fewer conveniences, at present, but is happier overall. On the other hand, he is more than someone living in the primitive isolation presently required for 100% freedom. This very psychological paralysis is what affects the controlled schizophrenics so totally, and I believe it is the primary reason why as many leading celebritarians glorify his wannabe majesty the shiny rug as they do. Not too long ago, celebritarians decried the war on terror, the violations of civil liberties, such as the NSA's dragnet wiretapping, which itself was based on phony national security due to the alleged Islamic threat, and central banking, but now these very same celebritarians demonize the Syrian refugees, many of whom are Christians, and tacitly acquiescence to the scathing immorality of government war, sounding little different than the neoconservatives, and other supporters of George W. Bush's presidential administration. Alone, this is grounds for freedom outlaws to decry and ostracize these Volksdeutsches who advocate the very same government propaganda they used to oppose, if anything, this fundamental change in rhetoric and the divisiveness it has caused within libertarian circles reminds me of the public disputes about the 2014 Ukrainian revolution showing how Vladimir Putin's libertarians are little else than well-heeled, and domesticated lapdogs for the Kremlin, whether they realize it consciously or not. Is there anything else to be learned from the phenomenon that is controlled schizophrenia? Rayo wrote. Whether one will be happier as a freeman or as a slave partly depends on the individual. But this choice is not open to most libertarians. Relative contentment and servitude is possible only for those who believe in it, most libertarians are too independent and well informed. For libertarians the choice is between freedom and neurosis. What became of those libertarians of five years ago who gave up, or never tried, achieving personal liberty? Of people I knew, one is now a Catholic. Another is a Mormon. Another committed himself to a mental hospital. Many are occupied with chronic ailments. Again, this emphasizes the significance of integrity, and ends means consistency. What controlled schizophrenics, like those in the anti-libertarian Libertarian Party who chose Gary Johnson as their presidential nominee this election cycle, despise more than anything else, is sincerity. The partyarchy refuses to tolerate anyone who, at least, attempts to, 
steadfastly hold on to libertarian principles, and the same is easily observable with the celebritarians who support the rug that is the Donald. These two factions are woven from the same cloth of authoritarianism, for should you fail to tolerate either party line, you are either a purist or a cuck, even if in the latter case you rebuke the social justice equality freaks publicly, as I have. Going into the future, I think Rayo's observation here is rather apt. Freedom does indeed need more full-time professionals, not collective movement preachers seeking a coterie of followers, but explorers slash inventors slash developers of liberated lifeways. That, more than anything else, is what is causing such a rift between political crusading reformists and freedom outlaws, a fundamental difference in terms of strategy and tactics, not altogether unlike the historical disagreements regarding strategy between the Bolsheviks and the Fabian socialists. A separation betwixt the political means and the economic means of making money, between reformism and direct action, is what truly separates someone like Christopher Green, Eric English, Alex Jones, and even anarchists like Stefan Molyneux, Christopher Cantwell, and Dr. Walter Block from someone like Shane Radliff, Cal Molyneux, and Larkin Rose. Ignoring this true dichotomy only serves to backslide all the effort that has been placed into shrinking the coercive power of the state. I hold that to be willfully blind to this is to be done at your own peril. These popular narratives about the bombastic self-righteousness of the Trump and Johnson supporters alike that they can do no wrong is prima facie evidence of controlled schizophrenia itself, of course, the party would have you believe that a purist like me is double plus ungood. And to close us out, here is the Bitcoin Bugle's Richard Dick Greaser with a song from his new hit album, Stay Misinformed. This song is called This Politician Loves Me. Please enjoy. I know this sounds crazy like I'm losing my mind But I swear if you vote for this guy, all will be fine This time will be different I promise and swear this politician gets it They will be fair I can look past that they will do bad things to people They said something I liked, please don't be sheeple Get out to vote and get your friends excited I swear to tell them the truth, we aren't getting gaslighted I swear this time this politician cares They see the country wrapped up in despair Oh how bright the future can and will be If you vote for this politician that loves me The system is broken, but let's make it less so The economy in shambles, but they will help it grow They will still surveil us, and force us to pay taxes But if you don't vote this way, everything collapses The key to victory is compromising what you believe This is the only way to get what you want to achieve Deny your values, but let your voice be heard Not agreeing with the propaganda makes you absurd I swear this time this politician cares They see the country wrapped up in despair Oh, how bright the future can and will be If you vote for this politician that loves me other guy is worse but wants the same things Yes, they are owned by corporations Pulling the strings But they said nice stuff that I wanted to hear I'll vote for them because the TV makes me feel fear This is democracy, never getting a real choice But if you don't vote, you don't have a voice So don't complain if you don't participate Just comply with the pressure, it's not too late I know what you think, I'm kind of a cook But this time is different, we will have luck After years of abuse, we need a real hero they said things I like, they aren't a zero I swear this time this politician cares They see the country wrapped up in despair Oh, how bright the future can and will be If you vote for this politician that loves me L 
LUA Pub Records presents the most inspirational alternative band in the world, Richard Greaser and The Bugle, featuring the first credentialed journalist, songwriter, and producer. Is he the next Leonardo da Vinci? No, he's just a man who smokes a lot of cigarettes and has a bachelor's in journalism, with great inspirational songs like The Princess and the Podcast Listener. I need a prince charming to save me from my depression. A man whose full-time job is listening to Bitcoin podcasts. The hit track, Non-Compliant 1776. All across the country, the people are awakening. Politicians are quivering and shaking. This one-of-a-kind album titled Now That's What I Call Defiance is filled with instant classics. This album is not available in stores and limited digital quantities are available, so order now. Visit libertyunderattack.com slash bugle music to order today.